Yep. As well as Stanley's Northeast Barroom, they are our bacon sponsor. Skelly Video Productions, Molecule Marketing, Sterling Cross PR, Muddy Paws Cheesecake, New New, and Make It MSP. Let's give them a warm round of applause. These fine folks are the reason we can keep our ticket prices low and we can keep going strong. So uh, we thank them for their support and uh, could not do it without them. Okay, I'm going to click once. There we go. Leave my finger alone. Uh, we are going to be streaming. Uh, check our Twitter account soon for the link. Otherwise, uh, Facebook, right? Gabe, okay. Courtesy of uh, Skelly Video Productions there. Show of hands, who's here for the first time? Did it work? Excellent. Great. Uh, so welcome. And uh, we hope it is not your last time here. Uh, we've been doing this very thing, uh, connecting people and ideas over coffee and bacon since 2008. And we intend to do it for long time going forward. So uh, you can check out SMB MSP for information about upcoming events. We have our next three uh, months, first quarter of the year uh, scheduled already here in this space. And uh, you can sign up for email updates and all kinds of good things. So uh, check that out and we would love to hear from you about what you think and what you would like to see. We have, these are the dates I was just talking about. So January, February, March, uh, last Friday of each month, we are going to do paid social tips and tricks in January, social trends to watch in February, and social media case studies in March. So registration for all of those will be open very soon. And uh, you can find that on the website or, again, any of our social channels. All right. So you, the reason you are here is to see this gentleman. And uh, Eric has been a friend of Social Media Breakfast. You can go ahead and switch that around. Uh, since the beginning. And uh, we are lucky to be able to use his expertise and leverage his connections uh, many times throughout the year. So many of you might have seen him uh, moderate the session on podcasting a couple months ago. So always fascinating, always important information. Um, and I was really excited that he suggested this session because we really haven't done this topic before. So um, let's give a warm round of applause for Eric Hansen. How's everyone doing? There we go. Good to see uh, so many sweaters out there, right? I'm repping my, uh, my First Avenue sweater that my daughter hates, but I chose to wear it today. So good morning. Um, a little bit more about me before we begin. Um, whoops. Um, I am an independent social media and PR consultant. I've been doing that for the last 10 years. Um, I have, I don't know, 20-some years experience in the business. Um, I work mostly with larger companies like Sleep Number, who we'll talk about today, um, Walgreens, Walmart, General Mills, companies of that ilk. Um, and uh, the work usually revolves around social media consulting, content, training, all that kind of stuff, PR, media relations. I'm an old PR guy, so that's kind of my background. I'm also a blogger. I blog at the Talking Points blog, which is erichanson.com. Um, I have more than 1,300 blog posts that I've written over the last 10 years. I'm a podcaster. I podcast with my friend Kevin Hunt from General Mills. We talk about many host of issues in the social media and PR realms. Um, we have over 130 episodes there. And I also uh, design an e-newsletter designed to keep people like you ahead of the curve. So if you're inclined to do that. It also has jobs in there. If you're looking for a job, which is relevant to the conversation today, you can go to erichanson.com and find that. And then most recently, I'm also an adjunct professor at the University of St. Thomas. Any Tommies in the crowd? Nice. Nice, I'm going to come find you afterwards. Always looking for people to come in and speak at class. So um, I've been doing that. I just, did, I just completed my first semester this fall, so I'm really uh, excited about that as well. So enough about me. We're here to talk about employer branding. And I'm going to make this, it's social media breakfast for God's sakes, right? So we're going to make this a little bit social media today, right? I've got a couple questions interspersed into the presentation today just to get some feedback from you all that we can discuss after. So uh, first question being, what's one thing you want to learn about employer branding today? If you go to my account on Twitter, Eric Hansen, and tweet at me using the hashtag, we'll maybe talk about a few of these questions afterwards. So I want to start by taking you back to 1999, right? Go back to, so okay, not everyone, don't everyone go back to 1999, because some of you, 1999, you were in middle school, right? Like, I was not in middle school, but 1999, right? And meet George. So really James Franco, but George, right? 
You guys have all seen these stock photos, right, that they put, him and Vince Vaughn put out there a while ago. I use these all the time. So this is George. And George is a job seeker in 1999. He graduated from St. Cloud State University, and he is looking for a job in public relations in the Twin Cities. Now, for those of you that, are old enough, that weren't in middle school in 1999, what, 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 how would George have looked for a job in 1999? Monster, maybe. Yeah, that was around, right? Anyone else? Newspaper ads, those were a thing. Yes, newspaper ads. There was classifieds, people, right? Want ads, that was a thing. People looked in those, yes. Sarah. Yep, online ads, same thing, kind of classifieds, yep. Jo actual job boards, right? Like a cork board with like push pins in there with pieces of paper, that was a thing, right? You look for jobs that way, job fairs. That was a thing in 1999. Talking to your, peop your, your friends and family, he, he probably did that, right? So he had a few options, right? So that's how G George would look for a job. Now, whoops, we'll, we'll fast forward to Emma. You're right, it is temperamental. Meet Emma. So Emma graduated from Winona State. Woohoo, Winona State! That's right, see? I got a lot of friends in the audience. Emma is looking for a job in social media marketing. So near and dear to my heart. She graduated in 2018. 2019, this year, she's looking for a job. How would Emma go about looking for a job? What resources would Emma look to to find a job? LinkedIn, right? What else? Indeed. Glassdoor, what'd you say? Networking breakfast, right? <laughs> Correct. Yes. Twitter. Facebook. Instagram. Job boards, monster, people said monster, right? Friends and family. So think about all the additional options that Emma has. At her, that's just a few, right? There's more. We'll keep going. That Emma has at her disposal than, jo than George had 20 years ago. And think about the transition that's made there. And then think about, is your company managing all those outposts and thinking about it from a job seeker perspective? Because people are looking for you out there. And what are they finding, right? So a different way to encapsulate this, I keep doing that. I got two quotes here from actual friends of mine that are job seeking right now. I'm not going to out them, but I wanted you to see their quotes because this is kind of reconfirming what Emma's experience was, right? I've spent a lot of time on LinkedIn figuring out the question I posed to them was, what kind of tools are you using in the job search process? I've spent a lot of time on LinkedIn figuring out who works where and who I know at various companies. Also Glassdoor more sporadically for red flags. I also check Instagram. I think it's an interesting way to see at a glance how brands choose to portray themselves and how much they invest in social and digital. So, right, friend number one is definitely using some of the tools we talked about. Friend number two. Friend number two. Friend number two. I'm going to go so quick. <laughs> I wasn't in an active job search nor looking for a change, but came across a posting on your Talking Points blog. It was there that I first saw the posting and then went on LinkedIn to learn more, to learn more about the company and the industry. I leveraged my networking group and our masterminds group, blah, blah, blah. In researching the company, I also looked at Glassdoor and Indeed, right? So looking, looking to use Glassdoor and Indeed as research tools and understand what others had said about working there, the culture, work-life balance, compensation, advancement opportunities. So as you can see, People are using a lot of these tools, not just to look for jobs, but to research as well. I know it seems obvious at this point, but I'm setting that up. So to confirm, Job Seeker of 1999, and you're going to love that website up there in the upper left-hand corner, right? Job boards, classifieds, the first generation uh, career sites, job fairs, and then the Job Seeker of 2019. And I thought this was a pretty good representation of what it looks like, right, right now? Because think about all the touch points on this thing, right? Let's, let's go back to Emma for a second. Emma looks for a job. She probably starts with LinkedIn or Indeed or Monster or something like that, right? Then she, she finds a job. She talks to a friend about it. Then she checks out their Instagram page. What kind of things do they post out there? What kind of things to talk about culture? Any kind of people shots? Any kind of culture shots out there? Then she goes on Glassdoor. Like, what's, what, are the, what, what, what do people say about their CEO? What are the unfiltered reviews from uh, employees that work there? And she talks to a few more people. Then she goes back to Glassdoor and researches and digs around some more, finds information on benefits. And she goes to Facebook. She wants to see what kind of content they're posting there. Then she gets the interview. 
She goes back to Instagram to double check some things, look at culture, look at a few people she met in an interview, talks to a few more people, gets the job, celebrates, right? Think of all the touch points that Emma had in that job search. And then again, think about, is your company managing those outposts and thinking about it from a job seeker perspective? Because that's what's happening. We all know that. We're all doing it right now, right? But companies aren't necessarily keeping up to speed with that and thinking about it in that way. They're still thinking about it from the master brand perspective, which is fine, obviously. But a whole other world going on out there that's very important right now. So I thought we'd level set a little bit by talking about what an employer brand is, because some of you, that might be the question you asked at the outset. Like, what's an employer brand? I don't even know what that is. And you can get all sorts of detailed and lengthy explanations on websites like Sherm and things like that. But I thought this was the best way to describe it and the way that you can all describe it to people that you work for or your management teams that makes it easier to understand. And that is, your, your employer brand really is just your reputation as a place to work as well as your employee's perception of you as an employer. I mean, that's it. I mean, I'm a PR guy, right? So like the PR, a PR people, for those of you in the crowd, you know, like our job is to maintain and nurture the reputations of our clients and our companies, right? Like, this is just doing that from an employer's perspective, right? It's just the same thing on the other side. So why an employer brand? Why are more companies going this direction? Or why should more companies be going this direction? More people that ever are, are looking for a job, right? So stat-wise, we know that 67% of US employees are disengaged at work. Now, I'm not gonna ask people to raise hands, but I'm guessing there's a lot of people in this audience that are disengaged at their job. That's fine, I've been in jobs where I was disengaged before. Everyone goes through that, right? Also, the quit rate, <laughs> which is the rate at which employees voluntarily leave their jobs is now 2.3%. That's the highest it's been in 15 years. Like, that's pretty high, right? Add to that, 51% of people say they're actively looking for a new job or open to a new one. So it's this concept of always looking for a job, right? Again, half of you in this room are looking for a job. Maybe passively, maybe actively, maybe both. Why? Well, we're gonna have some fun here for a second. So that goes, that goes on and on. And the best part of it is, I don't know if, you, if anyone's seen that one, but at the end, um, God, I forgot the actor's name, but he comes in and he's, the same, he's like challenging him and he has like a trident and they battle and then Will Ferrell basically kills him and then he keeps stabbing him for like 20 minutes in the background, just like. Burr, burr, burr. So people are leaving their jobs because they hate their bosses, right? Everyone's had a Will Ferrell boss, right? Every, every single one of us. And that's one of many reasons why people are leaving their jobs. But people are looking for jobs constantly. So there's this, there's, this, there's this notion that not only is there more people looking than ever before, but now job seekers have the power, right? I have a, a job seeker at home, and she's looking for a job. And I keep telling her, like, you have the power. Negotiate. Like, and companies sometimes don't realize that, and I think increasingly they're getting the hint, but they're a little bit behind. So number two, job seekers are turning to social. And, uh, you know, again, might seem obvious to this crowd, but to the general population, not just to search for jobs, but to research jobs, right? So a few stats here. 79% uh, of job seekers say they are likely to use social media in their job search, right? Okay, that seems pretty obvious. Uh, three and four millennials found their last job through social media. That's a pretty damn bearing stat. And then I like this last one because it gets at a point I hear from clients all the time, and that's 67% of jo social job seekers use Facebook 
to search for jobs. And what I'll hear all the time from, from, empl- from clients is like, well, why would you use Facebook for employer brand work? And because they're used, people are using it. Of course they're using it to find jobs, right? It's not the only reason they're going there, but it's one of many reasons, and they're open to looking for jobs there, right? It's not just all about LinkedIn and Glassdoor and Indeed. So um, question number two, if you're, if you're so inclined to go to Twitter, um, does your company actively manage its employer brand presence? And there's a poll on there, yes or no, blah, blah, blah. So I'm just curious to see how many people are actively doing this. So. If you were to start an employer brand from scratch, I'm guessing that's why a lot of you are here today, or you want to advance the current one you have a little bit, how would you start? Well, you know, this isn't really all that different from PR or communications consulting or, you know, planning, right? You're going to, you're going to start with goals, right? So typical goals would include generating awareness for your organization as a place to work, driving traffic to your career site, driving actions on your site, um, whether that's applying or signing up for any newsletter with jobs, whatever the case may be. A big, a big deal in the HR world is reducing cost per hire. So if, if, there's, uh, if you work with your HR team in this way, that'll be, that'll be, I'll touch a nerve with them because they're always looking to do that. Um, engaging existing employees. That's also a big goal that a lot of people overlook when it comes to employer brand because you're not just recruiting. You're, existing, you're, you're working on retention too, right? You want to keep the employees you have as well as gain top talent as well. And then obviously, what we're all going after with employer branding is driving applications. So driving applications is kind of like, well, I tell the, I work with Sleep Number on this, and we talk about uh, driving applications and driving leads that way is, is pretty much the same as selling beds for them, right? So it's the same thing. Master Brand's got their lead, and employer brand has theirs. So those are some of the typical goals you'll run into. From a strategy pr- perspective, um, some of the typical strategies, I'm not going to go through all, you know, all of them that are possible, obviously, but this gives you a good smattering of what to expect. Um, showcasing your culture through storytelling, that's a big one, right? If you work with an HR team, they're just going to push jobs all the time, right? And you're going to have to be the one that says, hold on a second, let's talk about what it's like to work here. Let's talk about the culture. Let's talk about the people. Highlight your employees to show job seekers what is possible. So if think about if you think about this from your perspective, think about it from a job seeker perspective. What is it when you research a company? Well, what do you want to know, right? You want to know, well, I want to envision myself working there, right? What's it going to be like to work there? You can do that. You can give people that glimpse very easily. Um, demonstrating your values um, through video, I think, is a good idea. And then, you know, showing that day in life through stories. I was just talking to uh, DJ. Where's DJ? DJ over here was securing. He was talking about how he did this with, uh, with his team at securing and how they gave uh, uh, interns um, a camera for a day and just said document it your experience and then we'll, we'll post it on Instagram stories and that sounds like that worked incredibly well for them. So that's a great example. Like that's the kind of stuff um, that kind of gives people that day in life uh, feel and, and, exa- and, and again kind of points people to what's it like to work there? Like could I envision myself working there? So the channels back. Okay. Sorry. There we go. The channels. So I'm not going to go through all the channels, but the primary channels, I would say, kind of fall into four buckets. Number one, Indeed, obviously. So Indeed is a big one. And again, Indeed isn't just a channel where people go from an employer perspective where you post jobs. It's also an outpost where people can find more information for you. So I'm going to see if this works, but there we go. So if you scroll down, you can see all this different information you can find on Indeed about employer. Very similar to Glassdoor, right? And you can see there at the top, it, uh, on the top nav there, it's a snapshot, upper left, and right next it says, why join us? That tab is the one where you can kind of fill in some specific information uh, to your company. Oops. Number two, Glassdoor, obviously very similar to Indeed, but more of a research tool, right? So it's, it's been funny how like Indeed has tried to gravitate more towards Glassdoor, and Glassdoor has tried to gravitate more towards Indeed, and they're kind of very similar now in that they both have places where you can set up a social outpost. Um, Glassdoor obviously is, hangs its head on having unfiltered information. So this is the place you can go to find out what people really think about the company. But as a brand, you have a chance to input and provide input and, 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 uh, and add content too. So let's see if this scrolls. There we go. So you can see on the right-hand side here, you'll see some of the things, right? So jobs you might like, company updates, that's kind of like a feed in Facebook. And you can add information there. 
keep going down, there's, some, you know, there's your photos, there's your benefits, company videos, all sorts of stuff. So you can see you have plenty of opportunity to add content that can help round out that experience for job seekers. And then uh, Facebook, right? We talked about Facebook at the outset. That's not a, a, an outpost to ignore. And again, Facebook gives you opportunity to brand yourself from an employer brand perspective too, because obviously you have the feed, but you also have tabs like, I think it's gonna switch here in a second, the reviews tab there on the left. Yep, there we go. Right, company reviews, you can see Target hasn't responded to these yet, but um, all sorts of reviews, just like you would get on Glassdoor, right? Unfiltered content, right? And then you have this job search tab, which gives, again, gives you the opportunity to kind of customize a tab, just like you would. I mean, this is a big deal, like, you know, five, six, seven years ago, I remember on, on, business, on business pages, and now you can do this on the employer brand side, too. No reason you can't do that. Oops, I skipped LinkedIn. LinkedIn, obviously. And you know the nice thing about Target, and this is no surprise, Target's doing this, but look how well they're branded, right? They all look the same, right? Which is perfect, right? If you're a job seeker and you go to any sites, they shouldn't look different. It's the same company. It should be consistently branded across. And it's just as easy as like, you know, putting a consistent header on there. Something as simple as that can go a long way. So LinkedIn, obviously, we know about the feed. On, uh, no, it's not letting me do that. Anyways, on LinkedIn, we know about the feed, right? So you have the opportunity to add content in your feed. But you also have the opportunity to add, you know, jobs. And this life section is the big thing, right? If those of you that might manage this on behalf of your companies, you know about the life section where you can add photos, videos, customized pieces of content. You're trying to tell your company's story to a job seeker. So don't ignore that life section because that's a big part of what the opportunity you have on LinkedIn to kind of fill out the profile. And then the last one I was going to show you was, um, sorry about the clicker, guys, um, TikTok. So obviously I'm not going to go through all the channels. And I know everyone's going to snicker when I throw up TikTok. But if you're Panera, you're not snickering about TikTok right now. Does anyone want, know what happened with Panera recently? So Panera um, had an employee, who, a uh, younger employee, I think, who chose to, as my son would say, expose Panera and the way they make macaroni and cheese. So what they did was this employee made a TikTok out of, um, you know, literally in the store, taking the little macaroni and cheese. I don't want to spoil it for those of you that love the macaroni and cheese there, but... They took the macaroni and cheese packet and then they boiled it in water and then they serve it up, right? So they were exposing how Panera, as, in, as if anyone's surprised by that, you know? Um, but, this, but this thing went everywhere, right? Because it was a negative, they made it negative, they made it fun and it was very TikTok-y. And, uh, and it got media coverage, it blew up everywhere. And uh, as a result, Panera fired the employee. So that was a big deal to Panera. Well, as it turns out, if you just look at the hashtag Panera, there's a ton of other people doing that too. So, my point here is like, when a new and emerging channel like TikTok comes out, does Panera have to get on TikTok and have a big presence there? No. Do they need to pay attention and listen? Yes! Because their employees are doing this stuff. Look at this. I mean, if you look at what they're doing, hopefully this will let me scroll. Oh. Their employees are, uh, okay. <laughs> Stop! Anyways, their employees are mimicking what this, what this lady did when she got fired, right? And they're just, ex the exposed thing is, is a real deal, obviously, for young people, and that's what they're doing. It's okay, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, I'll manage. Um, exposing Panera along the way, right? And again, my point, and there was a lot of talk about this when this happened, that Panera, again, Panera needs to get on TikTok, and they need to handle this, they could have more fun with this. And I'm thinking, no! Like, they just fired an employee. They're not going to go on TikTok and, like, risk that from a legal perspective? No way. But what they can do is listen and pay attention to this and then deal with it internally. That's what they, sh that's what they should be doing. I'm sure they are, right? Because they have steps they can take internally, right? They can, if they're seeing this on TikTok, what should they be doing internally? Updating their policy, training, reinforcing training up and down the road. I mean, there's tons of stuff they can be doing internally to make sure that this stuff is not happening as, as frequently as it's happening now. It would be very easy. Because right now, I'm sure these young people are like, oh, yeah, I'll just make a TikTok. I mean, they're not even thinking about it. They're not even thinking about it. And that poor girl who got fired, like, I'm sure she didn't think about it. She just did it. So this, lastly, this is kind of the big question that a lot of people have about employer branding is, like, who should manage it, right? Because on one, you have a tug-of-war going on. On one hand, you have the HR team 
who owns recruiting, right? Who owns people in the organization. So that makes sense, right? And on the other side, you have comms or PR or corporate communications or whatever you want to call us, people like me. And okay, we own storytelling. We own um, reputation. Makes sense for that person too, or that team too, right? So it's this constant tug of war. And in some organizations, HR owns it. And in other organizations, comms owns it. And there's not a right answer. I'm not gonna sit up here and tell you that I know the right answer. Um, but I can tell you what I've seen work really well and what I haven't seen work really well. And I hope there's, I'm not gonna offend the HR people when I say this, but like when HR owns it, again, they're, they're gonna, t I'm not always, not always, they're gonna tend to focus on the jobs, right? And then at the expense of ignoring culture, people, brand, all that stuff, right? And what I've seen work best is when there's either a, a very close partnership between HR or comms, or better yet, when there's a comms person embedded in the HR team. Because then HR does own it, but there's a comms person that's kind of running the show. And they know, right? So the comms people is, is, is tied to the objectives of HR, which is great, and they're closer to it, which is also great, but they also have the skill set to do the work, right? Because a lot of it is storytelling, capturing photos, managing video production, all that stuff. Like, that's what comms people are trained to do. Like, that's what we do. Um, and that's what I've seen work best. So this is a big question, um, and one you're all gonna, if you're gonna start an employer brand, you're gonna have to wrestle with, and it's gonna be different for everybody, but um, that's just my two cents on what I've seen work uh, fairly well over the years. So question number three, um, who manages your employer brand? I'd be curious to hear if you are doing this. Is it the comms team? Is it the HR team? Is it a mix? I think I only gave you two options in Twitter, but I'd be curious to talk about that after with everyone as well. So I wanna spend uh, the bulk of the time today, or at least the back half of the time, talking about case studies, because I thought it, the, the easiest way to kind of show what this looks like in action is to show you companies that are doing it. So I'll show you three companies that I've observed doing it um, in Chipotle, Home Depot, and Starbucks, three of the companies I think are doing the best in certain ways, at least. And then we'll talk about Sleep Number, which I know intimately because I've been working with them for five years on this, so I can give you a little more depth into what's going on. So, we'll start with Chipotle. So, Chipotle actually is probably one of the best, I would say. And it's probably no surprise because as a fast food or fast casual restaurant, like they have ongoing needs to recruit and retain, right? So, you'll notice a lot of the, a lot of the brands that are very active with their employer brands are brands like that, like retail, fast food, like those are the brands that you know, have the most churn. Now, Chipotle, one thing they've done that has turned out to be a big conversation topic, and again, something you're gonna, want, you're gonna probably talk about with your, with your employer clients is, do we do separate employer brand accounts, or do we just contribute to the master brand accounts? And Chipotle obviously has chosen to do separate brand accounts, and for good reason, because again, they have a bigger need, they're a big company, they have resources, they're resourcing for it, all that kind of stuff. But in general, what I've seen is like, the bigger your company is, the more apt you are to have separate accounts because you have resources, right? If you're a target, you have resources that you can put towards creating separate employer brand accounts, and they've done that, right? If you're a small business, Joe Bag of Donuts, you don't ever, you can barely keep up with social media as it is, right? You're not gonna create more accounts, right? So like, and if you're in the middle, then it gets a little dicey. That's where it's like, well, what should we do? But that's kind of the, the guidepost that I'm seeing out there right now. Chipotle has separate careers, right? Chipotle also does a nice job, a really great job, as you can see from that first, that first slide too, is focusing on their people, right? They're not pushing jobs all the time. They are, but they're pushing it through their people. And they're telling great stories about their people as well, right? So it's not just like, you know, let's focus on our people and, and throw a headshot out there. It's like, let's tell a story. And let's meet Jonathan, right? So here's a great example. So this is a great two-part example right here where they, this is their Facebook post, right? Meet Jonathan. They have a nice little templated post, so it's branded. It's starting to tell a story, and then they kick you to the website. What do we find on the website? We find the full story, right? And this is exactly what they want you to do. They want you to go to the website, the career site. Why? Because what do we see up there in the right-hand corner, right? There's a call to action. There's job alerts. Sign up for that. There's a lead, right? Search jobs. There's another lead. Benefits I can search for. Career paths. I can look at corporate. I can look at the, how it's, what it's like to work in the restaurant. Like, all sorts of rich information that the job seeker is going to love once it gets to that website. So Chipotle does a wonderful job of that, and a great company to mimic. They also obviously do a great job of not only featuring the, the people, but storytelling, really, and getting into the stories. If you look at this Instagram post, um, is a perfect example, right? So this isn't 
when you think of like, what's it like to work at Chipotle? It, would you ever envision this kind of photo, right? Does this tell the story of what it's like to Chipotle? But it, it's, but it's true though, right? It's a family. And oh, it turns out they, they were high school sweethearts. And then they met at Chipotle, but not at the same Chipotle. And they make a joke there about HR. Like it's fun, it's airy, but it tells a story about people that work at Chipotle that kind of draws you in a little bit, right? And they, they do this consistently very well. They also focus, again, when they're focusing on their people, you can see front and center here, all over their people all the time. But they do it in a way with great photography. So this is another sticking point with employer brand, much like it was with master brand early on. It's like, well, how do we get all these you know, visual assets that we're going to need, which is even tougher with you know, HR, because the HR budget is not going to be quite as big usually as the master brand budgets, because we're not, we're not selling a product that's going to make us money. We're, we're selling jobs, right? So it's a tougher sell to get more money. And as a result, you know, sometimes visual assets suffer, not with Chipotle. They've clearly invested in photography. You can see here, these are professional photos. They've done a great job. Uh, even if they're not professional, someone professional is taking them, is the point. And I mean, just look how well this, this, this shot is framed up. This could easily have just been a straight on headshot, right? But they didn't do that. They, they took her outside, give us some personality. Like this is mostly, you know, 15 minutes with this woman trying to get a great shot, right? Frame up Chipotle in the background, get some of the greenery in there. like. Just really well done, and a good example of them focusing on photography. They also do a nice job of repurposing customer testimonials that play to the employer brand journey, right? Because that's a big part of it, right? Like, I, I think about my, my, my folks at Sleep Number. Um, at Sleep Number, their mission is to improve lives, right? So a lot of, a lot of big reasons people come to work for Sleep Number is because they want to improve lives by selling those beds and getting people a better night's sleep, right? So Chipotle is kind of doing the same thing here with this uh, Jamie Kirby, a customer, obviously. The employees at my Chipotle by my apartment are the closest thing I have to family in New York City. Like, that's a, great, that's a great feeling for those employees to see that, right? And it's a great feeling for other employees to see it. And it's a great a message for job seekers that might want to work at Chipotle. Wow, if you work at Chipotle, you could actually really connect with customers. That might, that might m matter to someone, right? And they'll do this on a regular basis. So scouring Twitter, scouring Instagram, you know, seeing what kind of uh, brand messages you can you can find about people talking about your brand, as a way it, in a way that it relates to the employee. Oh. So Home Depot, a couple of things Home Depot does really well. Um, uh, that's a great another great brand to check out if you're looking for examples of brands that do it well. And I might I might add too, I don't know this. This is be my best guess. Chipotle, and Home Depot and Starbucks all have teams of people. So like if you're like the social media person for your, for your organization, and you're thinking, oh, am I going to do this? These guys, have, I'm I almost guarantee they have teams of people, right? So look at them and look what they do, but don't think I, I, can, I can be like that because th th it's, it's probably unfair, right? But what Home Depot really does well, a couple things. Um, a, they've established a nice visual identity for their employer brand online, and really by owning the color orange. So if you go into any Home Depot, that's one of the first things you notice, right? It says orange everywhere, right? And you notice the first thing, on their social accounts is that in spades. Like there's, you're seeing tons of orange everywhere. So do a great job of that and thinking through what the visual identity will be online. So again, it's very much like master brand, right? If you're on the master brand side, you're thinking about this kind of stuff. You're thinking about what's the, what's the color, I mean, brand guidelines, right? What's the color palette? What's the style? What's the tone? What's the tenor? You do the same thing for master, or for employer brand, right? It's just a different facet of the overall brand. So they do a great job with that. They also do a nice job with, um, you know, engaging existing employees. Remember I talked about at the beginning, that goal, like you have to engage existing employees? They do a nice job of that. Um, every, every once in a while, they have a post like this, right? Associates, we want to hear from you. Whether it's your own experience or just one you're proud of, use the hashtag, build it to bring it, and tell us how you bring it every day. We'd love to hear your stories. So this is great, right? Talking to existing employees. Now, I would argue that this is too general. If I were them, I would make this super specific. And I'll show you an example of what that looks like later. But this is a great concept. I just think they execute it a little off. I would make it more specific. It's easier for people to give feedback if it's a super specific thing. Starbucks. So Starbucks has left. And obviously, Starbucks, much like Home Depot, is uh, probably most likely well-resourced. But one thing they do really well is uh, they focus on their one of their, well, one of their bigger value propositions, and that is 
this cloud program in particular to keep a number of them on premise and to offer you know the cloud education at Arizona State online Facebook for free. It's incredible, right? That's a huge perk for people that work at Starbucks, I would say. It's a huge perk to get people in the door. So, not surprisingly, they highlight it a lot. But they do it in a really creative way, right? So this is a perfect example. It's a really good example. But they could have done any number of things. But what they did here was let the text be the text. Let the visual tell the broader story, right? The visual is super simple. These are the green, everyone knows the green aprons. And there you have the Bruce's name, which we all know. If you go into Starbucks, you really see that. And then Grant Jarrett right that. That's really powerful, right? That was a really smart way of doing it, I thought. And then they carry that through, right? There's another one. We all know about cups. There's another opportunity, right? So it's just really clever about how they do that visually and how they showcase that unique value proposition in different ways. They also do it via video here. So they're not, again, resist the urge to go through the motions. Like think about how you can demonstrate that you, whatever your unique value proposition is really creatively from a visual perspective, even for those stories. So they're doing it across, they're doing it across platforms, they're doing it across formats, they're creative, and just really, really well done. By Starbucks. But again, Starbucks, right, big team, Lots of resources. They may not have an agency helping with this. Who knows? But really, really well done. So those are the three examples I have of where I'm observing. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but I can, I can, I can take wild guesses based on experience. What I do know going on behind the scenes is what we do at Sleep Number. Now, Sleep Number has been a client of mine for five years, so I have a little more depth here. And they asked me to help them, uh, along with my client, Kelly Dewyland, uh, five years ago, developed this employer brand kind of from the ground up. Now, my client has responsibility for employer brand beyond social. They asked me to help specifically with social. So our challenges going in were, number one, we had ongoing hiring needs in retail, home delivery, and customer service. So much like I was talking about fast food and retail has, or their retail, has needs in this area, like they're right in that alley, right? Because they have, uh, they have churn, they're always looking for new people, they're always looking for top talent. Uh, number one, or number two, they had lower brand recognition in other parts of the company. So in Minneapolis, like most people know, if I ask people, to, if you heard of Sleep Number, most people are going to raise their hands, right? If I go to Nashville and do that, like probably one person is going to raise their hand. Um, if I go to San Francisco, not as many people, you know. So we had to build up brand recognition in the other market, again, five years ago. We had to build up brand recognition in these other parts of the country. And then finally, we wanted to, we wanted to establish Sleep Number as a beloved brand, a technology and innovation leader, and an employer of choice. And most importantly, those first two. So their vision is to become a beloved brand on the, on the lines of you know, Apple and, and companies like that. But more importantly, they want to become, they want to make the, tra and they are making the transition from like mattress company to technology, wellness, and innovation leader. So making that transition is tough, right? Because really at the end of the day, they just do build beds. But we're trying to get people over here to understand it's more about, it's not about the bed. It's about wellness. It's about living your best life. It's about performance. If you've seen their ads with the NFL, Dak Prescott and Kirk Cousins. Those were, those were the challenges that we had set out in front of us. So what did we do? Um, oops. We thought social could help us drive awareness in some of those key markets that we thought about outside of Minneapolis, St. Paul. We thought uh, we could drive interest in certain job categories. We knew we could drive traffic to the Sleep More Career site with the help of social media advertising. And we thought, we hoped we could drive key actions on the careers site, including applications. So those were our hopes at the beginning. And the way we went about that was uh, Im implementing a, a number of strategies. I won't go through all of them, but some of the key ones were leveraging, kind of starting by leveraging a channel specific approach um, really to everything, right? So we looked at Facebook and we said, okay, we're gonna try to reach, we know our home delivery and retail people are there, we know our existing team members are there, and we're, we're gonna primarily use self-produced and brand-produced content. I'll go over what that means in a minute. We've used uh, Glassdoor and LinkedIn as uh, to reach our professional employees and existing team members, and we wanted to use a, a mix of brand and third-party content there. So that's where we were just gonna talk about like the big brand moments, right? So our new partnership with the NFL, um, Shelly Eibach being highlighted as Entrepreneur of the Year, like stuff like that, right? We're not going to talk about everything there, we're just going to save it for the big things. And then Instagram was more of our catch-all, right? We knew a lot of people, this is, again, five years ago, four or five years ago, Instagram was becoming bigger, we just figured more people would be there, it was going to be our all audience, and, but we also used it as a, plan, a, a platform to showcase our culture, 
So the way we did that was we had, we created a hashtag, much like I showed you before with Home Depot, SN Life, and we encouraged employees to post about their day. And then all we did was curate that and post it on our channel, right? So if you, if there's multiple accounts that do this, like Microsoft Life is one that comes to mind if you want to see one in action, other than Sleep Number, that does a nice job. Same thing, all they do is just curate employee generated content as a way to showcase the culture, which is really smart. So think about it from, I just talked about how resourcing is gonna be an issue, right? This is a great way to resource it, right? You don't have to come up with content. All you gotta do is scour Instagram and encourage employees to do it and maybe incent them. So we also focused on producing four different types of content. These are some of the ones I just mentioned, right? Number one, self-produced content. So this was stuff we took in the office, like me or Kelly or someone we know at Sleep Number. Usually at corporate, because that's where Kelly is, my client, and I'm close. But it could be in one of the stores. Sometimes we'll source stuff around the Twin Cities, but it was like stuff that we took, right? Uh, number two was brand produced content. So this was the stuff that was gonna be like branded templates. So this is the stuff where we turned to, we turned at Sleep Number, we turned to our creative team internally. For you, it might be an outside vendor. It might be a solo designer you have, whatever. But like creating templates is the big thing, like branded templates. So if you wanna see really good examples of this, go to Home Depot does this really well, right? Or Chipotle, you saw the Chipotle ones I showed you before. Um, but we'll use them for engaging existing employees. We use them for jobs. Um, we have, I'll show you another one here in a minute, but we use them all over the place. Number three, employee generated content. So again, this is what we, this is really how we source uh, or have in the past at least, sourced Instagram, but we also use it on other sites too. If we get a particularly great piece of content from an employee, we'll use it on Facebook, we'll use it maybe even on LinkedIn, we'll even maybe th even post it on the you know, career site in some cases, it depends how good it is. But, uh, but that stuff's, always, we're always scouring the internet every day. So my job, literally every week, is to scour LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter for content using SN Life, using Team Sleep Number, using SN Employee, like there's a number of different hashtags we use or have used over the years to find that content. And then finally, um, third party content. So this, is, uh, this would include like media hits, primarily media hits really, that are talking about our brand. So in this case it was uh, David Callen, who's the CFO of, of Sleep Number, was recognized uh, in the Business Journal. That's a great story for us and got a ton of traction. Um, and we'll highlight that stuff. Again, predominantly really on LinkedIn and Glassdoor, but sometimes we'll take that outside and go on Facebook and even Instagram if it makes sense. So those are our big four content buckets. Um, and then we focused on, within that, with on, in four content kind of pillars, right? So number one, jobs, right? So the jobs content, jobs make sense, right? We're promoting jobs, but keep in mind the jobs content for us and the job pillar typically has represented either between 10 and 20% of our content. That's it. So 80% of it was not focused on jobs. Only 10% was really selling the jobs. Uh, number two, culture. And this is the, one of the big ones, right? So this is where you'll find this in droves on Instagram. You'll find it in droves on Facebook. Um, but this is really all about like, what's it like to work at Sleep Number? So you'll see shots of uh, people at trade shows. You'll see shots of people in the stores. You'll see shots of people working the booth at the Super Bowl in a few weeks. Like, what's it like to work there? Let's give them a broad, broad view of what it's like to work there. They had secondhand hounds in the other day to, to play with puppies. Like, that was perfect, right? Like, we do that kind of stuff, you know? Do you want to work at a place like that? Who doesn't want to play with puppies, you know? Number three, people, right? So we talked about people with Chipotle. With, with Sleep Number, this has evolved over the years. We, we've always focused on our people, but more recently we've kind of formalized it and started this people of Sleep Number um, kind of uh, theme, which is, we're ripping it off obviously from the New York, humans of New York, but same concept, but it allows us to go more in depth on the people, right? So what we'll do is every week we feature an employee and could be from a corporate office, could be from home delivery, could be from retail, could be from customer service. And we get you know, professional level photography and there's a nice little story. So it's, it's usually about, uh, I don't know, 500 words, 400, it's like a mini blog post really. But two or three paragraphs of the story of a person that works at Sleep Remember, it usually starts with like their personal story, right? So it hooks you with the personal and then it gets to like, why did they come to Sleep Remember? What do they love about working at Sleep Remember? That kind of stuff. Um, and that has worked wonderfully well for us and to the point where we use it not only on social, we use it internally too. So they focus on this content on their internal newsletter, employee newsletter as well. So they're using it in different spots than just, than just social. 
And then finally, uh, what we call brand level content or brand pillar content. So for us, this really means we're focusing on three things. It's either the vision of Sleep Number, which is to be a beloved brand, the mission, which is to improve lives, or their values. That's it. That's brand content. So if it focuses on any of those things, we're going to talk about it. This was a, a video that we had produced with Trisha Dirks, who's our senior vice president of HR, and she's talking about why she came to Sleep Number, her personal story, and then like the values and why the values are important to her um, at Sleep Number. So again, we, so there's a lot of rigor to like what, what channels are we using, um, what kind of content are we producing, and what are our pillars. If anything falls outside of that, like we don't use it, you know. Oh, I don't want to play that. So before I talked about engaging existing team members, here's how we do that. Remember I talked about the Home Depot example, a little too broad. Like this, this is what I mean by being a little bit more specific. So we found great success with this. And this seems so dumb, I know. But it works. And it's a great way for us to engage the team members at Sleep Never, really. All we do, roll call time, right? Uh, comment below with your name, position, and how long you've been improving lives. We'd love the chats to say thanks. So. Why is this smart? Well, we engage our existing team, right? And it was my job to go through and <laughs> reply to almost every single one of those 263 comments, which always takes me a while. So I have to plan very carefully when we post this to make sure I have time to do it. Um, but it gets a ton of action every time. And you know what's really great about this? What we've learned over the years, the first time we do it, we just kind of fell into it. And we're like, oh my god, this, we should do this again. So now we'll just do it once a year, basically. But what's great about it is like those 263 comments Look at some of the comments, right? These are just a smattering. But you can see some of these people, you know, 11.5 years, right? Um, it was three years. I mean, some of the, I didn't show you the ones where it was like 20 years. Like some of these people have been with the company for a long time or they have really great comments. So what happens then is like we take this content and turn it into more content. So to, like content begets content, right? So for the people that have been with Sleep Number for like say more than 10 years, 15 years or so, we'll call them and be like, hey, We'd like to feature you on our People of Sleep Number uh, series. Would you be open to that? Yeah, absolutely. We just got one more piece of content. Or if it's a particularly good comment that is something, you know, like, oh my God, I love working at Sleep Number. I've been here for 10 years. I love improving lives, blah, blah, blah. We'll take that snippet. Again, hey, can we get a picture of you? Can someone get a picture of you at uh, your retail store? Yeah, sure. We'll pair the quote with the, with the shot that they get and use that as content. So this post usually turns into like, 20 pieces of content for us because the, the employees are giving it to us, right? And then we just follow up and we get more and it works great. So again, learning how to be efficient and not having to recreate the wheel all the time, like stuff like we kind of fell into this, but we were, I feel like we were pretty smart about like once we saw what was happening, like leverage it, how can we make this more content, things like that. Um, we, we obviously, we leveraged, uh, from the get-go, we've leveraged uh, Facebook as our go-to uh, advertising platform. And again, remember, four, this is four or five years ago. We're still doing it now. But our goals are really three big things. Engagements, traffic to that career site, and actions. That's it. That's all we care about. So we develop a new plan every month that is based on hiring priorities and the hot markets that we're looking at. And we geo-target ads if we have to. Um, we split the budget each month between uh, sponsored posts on the wall, which are aimed at engaging, right, new, uh, new recruits or existing employees, and what do you want to call them, web-to-click ads or link ads on Facebook, which are designed to drive traffic and actions. That's it. And we do that every month. And it's evolved over the case, and right now, now we're talking about how we're using uh, retargeting more and stuff like that, but like, that's really the plan, and, and it's been a pretty effective plan over the years. Um, and we're using different ad units, kind of, or different ads to meet different goals, right? We're using those Facebook posts on the wall with photos and videos to meet our engagement goals primarily. Really just engagement, really. It, anytime they go to the website from the, from the wall, it's, it's, a, it's a bonus for us. But with the link ads, what we're looking for really is that traffic, right, and actions. So we're looking for, we want them to go to the website, they want things to check things out, and that's where they take the actions, right? Once they get to the website, they can search for jobs, they can sign up for our uh, e-newsletter, they can apply, that's what we want them to do. And then on Instagram, again, we're just going after engagements. So really the ads are doing the heavy lifting when it comes to traffic and actions. And therefore, it's incumbent upon us to develop content within the ads that's gonna try to do that the best way. We also try to tell uh, the Sleep Number brand story at the biggest events uh, that Sleep Number is involved with. So right now, um, that's CES. 
um, which is coming up in a few weeks here. Um, it might not seem like a big deal, but for, for Sleep Number, it really is, because again, they started out as a mattress company. And now, again, they're trying to establish themselves as like a tech brand. Well, if you're a tech brand, where do you go every year? You go to Vegas. So for them to go to Vegas was a big deal, not only as a brand, but from an employee perspective. Like it, there was an immense amount of employee pride, and still is every year, for them to go to Vegas and be a part of CES, because it's a big deal to go to Vegas and CES. So we thought, like, man, we're gonna document the hell out of this and tell the story about what it's like to work the biggest consumer electronics store, or, or, or consumer electronics uh, conference in the world. And that's a pretty powerful story, if you're a sleep member. So we've done that for four years now. Um, they also, I don't know if you've noticed, but Sleep Number has a new partnership with the NFL that they're broadcasting everywhere. And again, that has huge ramifications for employees, right? What employee doesn't want to go work? The Super Bowl, right? Remember when it was here? Like Sleep Number was everywhere. Employees got to staff all those booths. That was a great opportunity for them. They love that. And again, it was our job to document that experience and bring that to life and show people what it's like to be a part of a brand that's involved with the NFL and the Super Bowl. And sure, that doesn't apply to everyone. It doesn't hit everyone the right way, but it hits a lot of people the right way. And that's why they're doing it, right? Not just both in terms of buying the beds and working there. Absolutely. So we're telling uh, those stories with the NFL too. We, we show up at the NFL draft. Um, we do sponsorships. We've done a lot of sponsorships with players over the years, uh, Travis Kelsey, Dak, Dak Prescott, people like that. It's, it's been a wonderful sponsorship for them, and it's been a wonderful sponsorship from us from an employer brand perspective because it gives us more weight, you know? Like, we work with the NFL. You come work with the NFL, you might meet Dak Prescott, you know? Like, that's a pretty cool thing to say to some people that are, that are interested in the NFL. We also have, uh, we also use, boom, executives at LinkedIn and their visibility to build trust and typo, Eric, geez, um, and it adds depth to storytelling. So in this case, uh, we focus a lot of time and effort on Shelly, and Shelly Ibach is the CEO of Sleep Number, and just over the course of, I'd say, the last couple of years, actually, she's become very much more active on, on LinkedIn, and in general, really out there speaking on behalf of Sleep Number. But since she's been doing that, um, we've really been featuring her front and center um, across the board as a spokesperson for the brand. And she's a great spokesperson, so we're gonna throw her out there. Um, but it's not just Shelly, right? So it's also uh, people like Melissa Barra, who's our chief strategy officer. She's kind of speaking out on topics on LinkedIn from time to time. It's also people like Angela Gearhart, who's their vice president of brand experience. She's talking about like the booth at CES and how she helped put that together. So it's, it's multiple executives, but I think what this does is it just gives more depth to the Sleep Number story and gives more accessibility to, like if you're working at Sleep Number, you're working for these people, like they're, they might, once you post something on LinkedIn, I feel like you're a little more accessible, right? If you're, I, d I did a presentation here at Social Media Breakfast a few years ago and I talked about executives on LinkedIn and I used, I picked on Medtronic and I, I researched them and some of you are shaking your heads, you probably heard this. How many of them were even on LinkedIn? The CEO was even on LinkedIn. So like if you're gonna look at, look at work at Medtronic, you're gonna look that up probably, and if he's not even on there, like what's your first reaction? Like, hmm, ivory tower maybe, right? Like I'm not gonna ever meet the CEO. He's not even on link can't even get his attention on LinkedIn. Whereas like Shelly is out there, front and center. She'll respond to comments. Like it's an accessibility thing in a, in a way, but it's also a trust thing. Um, we also use, uh, we also think about community management, I think about it a little bit differently maybe than some other people do, and the way we think about it is like a, almost like a job seeker concierge service. So we, you know, we actively manage all our communities to build trust. We leverage a playbook that we developed from the very beginning um, that we update frequently. So the, 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 the purpose of the playbook really is to, like in case Eric or Kelly gets hit by a bus, could someone take this over very quickly? But also, like, it's detailing all the things that you need to manage that community, right? So there's users and passwords in there. There's uh, tone and style in there. There's answer to every question under the sun that we've answered in the last four years on social media in there, which is hugely helpful to me. Um, there's emergency contact info in there. I mean, there's tons of stuff that I use every day to manage those communities. Um, and that's been a, a huge boon to us. We also monitor, like I said, those hashtags um, pretty actively. We're tracking for volume and time to respond, which we're well under 24 hours, but 24 hours is usually our goal. And we're also partnering with the customer service team to make sure if people have questions about the beds, that we get that to the customer service team right away. So we use a tool called Sprinkler. Um, again, I know not everyone can use these fancy tools, but Sleepmare is a big company, they have access to that. And that really helps a lot because you can easily shift things within departments within a big company like Sleepmember very easily. So 
the way we look at this is very much like a concierge service. Like it's our job, if anyone expresses any kind of interest in sleep number, it's our job, my job in many ways, to get them to that career site and get them to apply. So I feel like the nicer I can be, the more human I can be, the more honest I can be, the better. And we, we try to do all those things on the page every day. And then uh, finally, um, we, we, you know, with content, we use, uh, you know, we just use Google Docs to plan out like 30 days. We're always planning 30 days ahead. So we're planning 30 days ahead in terms of hardcore content, but we're looking out usually a quarter in advance in terms of like big things coming down the line. So uh, our content calendar though has, you can see here, it, it kind of has like, you know, the type of posts. So those are our content pillars on the left there. It has uh, results. So we go back every month and put, plug back in results so I can see at a moment's glad if, if Kelly calls me like, hey, what, what, what performed uh, uh, you know, spectacularly well last year or last month? I can tell her, well, this post drove to 10 total actions and was 28, 28 cents cost per engagement. Like that's pretty good, you know? Like it's nice to go back and look at that. So we track that. Um, you know, you have the visual in there, you have the post that goes over here to the left and it has all the other social platforms. But it's an easy way for us to track this year over year. I have four of these for the last four years now. I can go back and look at every piece of content we've created for the last four years and how it performed. So this, is, this kind of tool has worked awfully well for us. I know a lot of people use this kind of thing, um, but that I would highly recommend kind of organizing in some way that with Google Docs. So result-wise, where have we come in four or five years? Uh, we've gone from social engagements of 120,000 in our first year to more than 2.3 million this year. Our social ad efficiencies have increased year over year, almost every year. Uh, you can see the traffic total there. We've gone from driving 12% of the traffic to the career site to almost 60% this year, which is crazy. We're driving more than 60% of the traffic to that site. And then total actions, we just started tracking this a couple years ago, but total actions for sleep number includes uh, applies, uh, job search, uh, job, they have this job matching tool that matches you up to certain jobs based on your experiences, and uh, there's a couple more in there too. Um, but we've gone from, you know, we've increased that by about 30% too. So uh, it's working, right? And my, my argument with this usually with, uh, with Kelly at Sleep Number is like, we, if we just do the basics really well, we're going to be fine, right? We don't need to get that crazy. I, what I showed you was not crazy, right? Like it wasn't like earth shattering stuff. But if you, can, if you can strategize based on data and then execute consistently over and over again, the community management's all about consistency, the content's all about consistency, the ad plan's all about consistency, you can, I'm convinced you can see pretty good results like the ones we have seen with Slate Member. So, um, I wanna look at the survey real quick. Did anyone take the survey? Did I get like zero survey responses? What do you think, Michael? Can you look at my page real quick? Well, that's a good question. You probably can't. We hadn't thought about that. Why don't we take, why don't we field questions in the meantime and then I'll look at survey results as we talk. Does anyone have questions? I'm sure the questions will just come up organically anyways. Here, I got it. Yes, sir. Thanks. Um, when you talk about the different uh, types of content and the pillars that you use, um, are you curating existing content or where, wh how active are you? Uh, how is that divided up? Do you have priorities? You know, we don't have enough of this kind right now. We need to, we need to stimulate the uh, development of that or whatever. Yes. Good question. Yeah, the answer is yes. So yeah, we do, we struggle with, I mean, to tell you the truth, like the brand produced content, we don't struggle with obviously because creative can make that anytime we want to within reason. But um, it's really the culture stuff that's the hardest to get because, you know, that's the stuff where it's, it's got to be, it's got to be interesting, right? So like the puppy stuff, that was good. It's puppies, right? We knew that. That's an easy one. But like, it's got to be interesting. It can't just be like a shot of like four people with their arms around. Like, like what's the story, right? Like what's happening? What's the story? What's the inflection point? That's where I'm saying, remember I was going back to like having the comms people embedded in HR. Like that's the big reason for it because like, Comps people are pretty good at telling stories and finding the story, and like that's the key to it. So it's the culture stuff that we struggle with the most, um, followed probably pretty closely by the people stuff. But uh, that's what we spend the bulk of our time running down. Because like the brand stuff, it's like we have a process for it, right? It's got to go through like a, a brand governance process. We do it like you know twice a year. Like that's pretty easy. It kind of runs on its own. But the culture stuff, it's almost like we got to look for opportunities, right? Like what's going on at corporate next month? What's going on in the stores? 
And a lot of that's like just running stuff down. Like you gotta call people, you gotta email people. Um, Kelly's gotta be in the right meetings. Like, you know, sometimes you just fall into it. So, good question. Yeah. Other questions? I got it. So we have a parent company that owns a few different brands. We have, you know, like, I'd say three brands that really have their own voice. I think we really struggle with how you talk about the culture when you have people who work for multiple brands. So for example, one of our brands, Bamboobies, you know, a couple of us work on that, but then we have, you know, a dozen people overall in just our marketing team working yeah. on multiple brands. So how do you show mm. that culture for the brands, but without it being like, here at APL, we're doing this, but you want to come from that branded voice. Right. Well, I would lean towards making it more personal, though, right? So you don't want to make it super branded. Like, the brands matter, obviously, but only to a certain extent. At a, cer at a certain point, like, the, uh, you know, the employee is going to take the job because of the people and the culture more than the brand, you know? So, like, I wouldn't go too heavy on the brand stuff, and I wouldn't worry about that as much. Like... I mean, yeah, you have to have it in there. You have three separate brands. Do you have like a master brand above it, or is it like three yeah, separate brands? So we have a parent brand, which is APL, and then we have three or four brands underneath it. Three of them have like a unique voice, I'd say. Yeah. So, for example, one of them has its own LinkedIn page. Okay. And now yep. we're kind of debating, like, does it even make sense for that brand to yep. have its own LinkedIn page? Do we yep. talk about the brand from that page or the parent page? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, it, it depends on the unique situation. Obviously, I have to learn a lot more, but... Uh, so I would, I mean, it's not like there's one right way to do it, there's right? Not, you know, no, it's not really. It depends on the brand, the company. I'm thinking about like Mills would have a similar situation, right? Because General Mills. That's the example I use. Right? There's yeah, a holding company, right, yeah. and then they have all these sub brands, right? But like at the end of the day, you're really working for General Mills. Like no one's working for Totino's when they're working there, right? They're working for General <laughs> yeah, Mills. Play, yeah. So, right. So maybe it is a master brand thing. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to answer that question in, without more detail, but. Sure. Um, no, that's really helpful. I don't know. We can talk afterwards, yeah. I'm coming. Where'd your hand go? Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, no. This is going to be a hard one. Oh, yeah. Hi, Eric. How are you? Hello. Um, I'm curious, uh, just if you have any uh, best practices or thoughts on soliciting Glassdoor or Indeed reviews, and just I'm trying to manage that balance of doing that, but also risk management, because right. we have a really great rating right now, and we want to protect that, too. Right. Good question. Great question. Um, I, I, I can only tell you I actually what I've done with clients, including Sleep Number, and that's been not much because we, we've talked about that before too, and we want them too, obviously, like good reviews, and they have them too, but I feel like almost the more you push, the more people resist almost, you know? Like you don't want to push too much, and we've tried, we've tried pushing, and we've tried incentives. I know what worked the best actually is when um, years ago Kelly did at Sleep Number did like a road show where she would go around and meet with people and talk about the importance. It was basically building the case for Glassdoor at the time, because this was probably three or four years ago. So Glassdoor wasn't quite where it's at now. So she was really just kind of making the case for Glassdoor. Um, but she was, also talk she was also soliciting reviews. And I feel like that's where we got the most of them. Because like, think about at Room and Board, right? Like you don't have millions of employees. You have, how many employees do you have? I don't so it's a small number. So like if you did a small road show and you got like, 50 reviews out of that, that's a big deal for you, right? So like maybe you do something like that and make it more impersonal, yeah. I feel like that's gonna have bigger, a bigger impact than like if you send out an email or, you know, and sent them even, like talk, just talk to people about it, you know? Because you're right, you probably have people that want to do it, it's just like you got to get them to do it. Did you yeah, have something to add there, DJ, on what Rebecca yeah. said or separate uh, question? Just on the glass door, I would be careful in 2020 that FTC is going to come out with new rules around soliciting. Uh, reviews so you want to be very careful about that you can be dinged by them for some fees my question is with an overall brand of secure and financial we don't have career sub brands we struggle with the mix of employee content as it relates mm -hmm. to our general audience the few hundred thousand followers and people that engage it's how much do they want to see an employee you know we're 5,000 employees yeah. across the country few hundred thousand people do they really want to see our employees faces all the time we struggle with what channels to put that on yeah. we have good engagement when it happens but we start to see that we when we get in a groove we create a lot of it and then all of a sudden it's too much we're like whoa, yeah. whoa let's let's you know press on the brakes a little bit right well as you know you don't have to create a lot of it though right especially if you're using advertising like you don't you don't need to create 20 posts a week 
<clears throat> but I think you can do too much, you know. But why couldn't you, if you created too much, why couldn't you just hold it, though, you know, unless it's super timely, you know. Like, uh, I'm thinking of even, um, I mean, you have things that are timely at security, like your, rate, your winter race that's coming up probably and stuff like that. But you have certainly other things that are evergreen that you could hold on to. Like, we do that with Sleep Number all the time where it's like, let's get, like, even the people of Sleep Number um, photo shoots, obviously. The one, at one point, our idea was, like, let's use those photo shoots. You're taking the photos anyways. Like, let's get a whole bunch of those photos and then use them in different, in different ways across the course of the year because we're going to need them probably. Um, so we're probably going to do that this year actually, So hopefully. So um, I don't think you can ever have too much content actually, I would argue. So I would gather all you can. But like, you know, in terms of like people feeling like too many people see it, I mean, I think sometimes you get a little my myopic as you probably know, right? Like, yeah, you think that, but you work for Securian, right? Think about the customer experience. Think about the, the job seeker experience. Like, the, most likely they would never say that. They would never say, oh, I'm seeing too much Securian in my feed, right? Like, even at Sleep Number, we, we post a ton of ads, man, and we don't get all that much feedback about, like, we're seeing too much. We don't want you to see it anymore, you know? So I think I would just maybe counsel people that way, right? Like, hey, I know we're close to this, but most people aren't. Um, I don't think it would be a problem, really, unless you're really posting 20 times a day or something like that, you know, which I know you're not, so... Other questions? Oh, here you go. Hi. Uh, I'm from the Bloomington Convention Visitor Bureau, so we're a tourism bureau, and we have almost no turnover. I'm the first new hire in three years. Um, and nice. so, thank you. Uh, and we have more of a problem of um, how do we activate our sales managers' LinkedIn profiles mm -hmm. to speak on behalf of the company. Mm -hmm. So I've taken on all the company profiles as well as doing one-on-ones with all the sales managers and basically curating their content for them. Okay. How do I take the training wheels off and let them talk about the company? Not from a salesy, like pushing standpoint, right. but like more about this is my life at this company and yeah. like trying to create more connection with clients yeah. rather than just pitching them all the time. That's tough. Salespeople are tough, right? Yeah. Because all they want, they're programmed to sell. <laughs> that's not a that's not an uncommon challenge. There's no doubt about that. I think so. You said you did training with them, though, right? Yeah. You know, what I've what I've seen work well, and I haven't done it with salespeople necessarily. I'm about to do it with a sales team actually. So this is relevant for me. But what I found works well with other teams was like when I did, we do like the initial training, right? Mm -hmm. And then we'd have checkpoints. So how many are there? There's not. There's there, seven sales. There can't people. be very many. Okay, seven. So you could do this. So mm -hmm. do the do the initial training. Maybe you do training like twice a year, but then have checkpoints with them to keep them honest. So like maybe you have. Uh, a monthly or bi-monthly checkpoint with them and that'll give you a chance to like you review their content and then you say okay you're still doing too much sales stuff man like you got to do this this and this mm -hmm. I mean it, it, it should keep them a little bit accountable at least and it'll give you a chance to get in their face every month or every two months and say no more less sales more culture more what it's like to work here more this that and the other thing you know um, I've had that experience with two clients now and it worked pretty well you know because it felt like like I was the teacher and they were the cl they were the class like they showed up to class they had, they, had, they had homework and then I graded them and it was like here's some ideas on what you could do differently um, that might work pretty well with them I think yeah thank you so one of the t uh, things you talked about was having a separate page for like a Facebook careers and then a regular Facebook page for your company. Yep. Um, if you work for a slightly smaller company, let's say like 30 to 40 employees, so you're not having a huge amount of followers, um, do you still recommend splitting those things apart or no. keeping them as one page? I wouldn't. I mean, without knowing the specifics, I wouldn't because, re I mean, resources alone, right? Like if, you have, if you create separate accounts and all of a sudden you've got to populate those things. And it's not like five years ago where you had to throw a kind of content in there. You've got to sum. You have to have a breadcrumb trail, you know? So... I would just say I would just say keep your, your your master brand account and like contribute to that. Cool. It'll still work, yeah. And you could use advertising to get through. So like, you, if you're doing it on Facebook or Instagram, I mean, just use just use ads to that allow you to target to a certain demographic and use whatever the content is you're using to get there. Does that make sense? Other questions? All right. You want to check your survey results? Yeah, maybe. Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, let's see what you said. How many people, let's just do a show of hands. How many people are managing your accounts right now? Right. 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 How many people are managing employer brand accounts? Do you have separate accounts? No. No. That's the trend, right? Do you have separate no, accounts? I don't know. I mean, like I said, with the small business, it's all, there's no right or wrong answers. Right? I feel like it's uh, the larger you get, you have 
separate smaller git just contribute to the master brand accounts. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to search. All right, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, Merry Christmas and happy holidays. Thank you very much. Have a great holiday. everybody check out social media breakfast in 2020 uh, follow skelly video productions so you'll be able to see these and they pop up right away uh, it'll also be live in HD on YouTube later today Merry Christmas everybody happy Friday